background is probably white. Welcome to the fourth of our Dunning webinar, uh, Dunning Africa webinar series, uh, hosted, of course, by the Henley Business School, uh, based out of South Africa. I'm delighted. Uh, I'm delighted to be here again, uh, this time on a set of very, very interesting speakers uh, covering a subject that has. Uh, very little coverage, very little traction in the academic community, and also strangely with governments and society at large. It's something that we all consume in large quantity, uh, uh, whether it's music, whether it's film, whether it's television. This is, in a sense, the soul of society, the soul of, of, of mankind today. Uh, you know, uh, you you can measure your your like or dislike of someone based on their musical tastes or their their preferences or certain Netflix series or what have you. you no, know, we connect uh, in this in this matter with each other and with with uh, and with society at large. Now, on, at the same time, the state is there and it's a very important part of. Uh, employment in society nowadays. It provides uh, it's a way of communicating with society. This is why television stations have historically been known by the state. It's a way of communicating with the people. It's also a source of tax revenue, uh, of investment, and so on and so forth. So it's really such an integral part of society. It's surprising that as a topic of research and a topic uh, of discussion in, in, uh, in intellectual circles, it's uh, not, not much attention is, is paid to it. So I think that it's about time that we do so. And this is what the Dunning Center is all about. We are here to create conversations, to get people thinking, to connect people in academia, with people uh, in industry, with governments, with society, and to debate the issues that matter for society today in Africa, by African, for Africans, and you know, there are no boundaries in the process of knowledge. Knowledge creation, knowledge is something that is global, has always been global. And, uh, you know, we want it to flow freely. We want it to be accessible to everyone, which is why these uh, webinar series, are, we do them for free. And we want to do this on a monthly basis for, you know, ad infinitum, as long as we can manage to, to do so. We really want to start conversations. We really want people to think about things they didn't think about before. So this is really, you know, kind of for me, a very exciting uh, event today. And, you know, I've been looking forward to it for a while. And we have uh, stellar names uh, from across the continent, particularly in, from Nigeria and from South Africa, in the music industry, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the television and film industries, uh, business people, as well as musicians and uh, producers and so forth, a variety of talent. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to focus, of course, on the business aspect of many of these things. But, uh, you know, we're talking to the people on the ground who are actually dealing with these things, people with wisdom and knowledge. And I want, of course, as usual, this is not a this high level discussion that will exclude the public. Uh, we want this to be a conversation between uh, like minded people, but also the audience is really welcome to join in. Feel free to add a chat in the chat box, uh, ask questions, um, and you know, engage with us. We don't want this to be ex excluding anyone. We want it to be inclusive as much as possible. But uh, yeah, enough from me. Uh, I'm just a talking head today. Uh, I'm, I'm here to listen and to observe and to learn, and maybe, in fact, you know, even to ask some questions myself. So I pass the, uh, the mic over to Barry, Barry Fanzil, our uh, able uh, uh, gifted, uh, shall I say, uh, musician, a businessman, 
man of the world, in fact, uh, uh, to take matters uh, further. Over to you, Barry. Thanks, Rajneesh, much appreciated. And just before I take the mic from you, would, would you like to just snapshot what the September um, offering is going to be on, on the series yes. before I forget at the end? <laughs> my apologies, I, my, my age is showing. Uh, yes, so as, uh, as some of you will already know, this is an event that takes place uh, on, the, on the first Thursday of every month. The next one is September 1st, and where we will be talking about uh, the Africa continental free trade area and its implications for investment in Africa. And I have, uh, uh, we have uh, two or three interesting speakers. Ziad Hamoui joining us from Ghana, uh, as uh, Francis Mangeni from the Nelson Mandela Institute for International Affairs, and uh, Andrew Mould uh, from the UN Commission for Africa. So that will be on the 1st of September. I'm really hoping that uh, a lot of you will come back to join us for that event. Thanks for reminding me, Barry. My pleasure, Rajneesh. And uh, for, for those, of you, those of you that don't know, uh, I have to share that uh, Prof. Narula, uh, he's, he's wearing his academic hat uh, right now, but he's a, he's a, he's a very well-versed connoisseur and consumer of music, of fine music. So uh, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that up front. So that he, he's, he's clearly vested in the, the subject matter um, tonight very firmly. And we've, we've had, over the years, many really uh, uh, fascinating conversations about jazz in particular. So uh, I just thought I'd, I'd put that out there right from the, right from the get-go. So, so thanks very much, Rajneesh. Thanks. Um, the, the, the subject matter uh, today is about the creative economies across the continent. And the, the, the topic uh, broadly is how can Africa's creative economies become a powerful engine for uh, economic growth? And this, this concept of producing locally and marketing globally uh, is, is top of mind. The, 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 um, the facts are that there's a huge volume and depth of creative talent across Africa. And the question is, why is it that the creative industries aren't fully exploiting this, um, the new opportunities offered by uh, a technology-driven global village, whereby producers of content can talk directly to their, to their uh, uh, identify and talk directly to their target markets. So we're gonna we're gonna focus for our purposes. We've got a, we, we've got a, a reasonably short time, sixty minutes of of uh, conversation, and then we we'll, we'll open it up for some uh, for some Q and A with with everybody on the call. Um, but, we, but we're gonna focus on film, fashion, and music for the session, and we're gonna explore obstacles and opportunities in both international and intra-Africa trade. The co-hosts, my co-hosts and panelists are all people that I've, that I've got to know and I admire greatly um, over the years. If I, if I could choose a dream team to, have a, to sit around a table and have a conversation with, this is the team. And uh, guess what? They've, they've, they've all agreed to show up this evening and sit around a, a, a virtual table and have a conversation. So without further ado, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, my co-host, Biola Alabi. And uh, Biola, <coughs> excuse me, is the, is the co-founder and general partner at Atika Venture Capital, which is a, a woman-led venture fund um, providing early stage capital in Africa. She's also an award-winning executive producer and the founder of Biola Labi Media, which is how we first met. And uh, Biola Labi Media is a Pan-African media and technology advisory firm that has worked extensively with local and global companies, governments, development agencies in the telecoms, media, and technology space. So Biola, welcome. Uh, and as we go, we'll introduce the, the other panelists, but I'm now going to hand the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Barry, and thank you for having me today for this really um, important conversation. I think that we can see globally the trends happening. We can see trends around 
um, social media platforms, increased in consumption. We see this huge creative economy being formed in different parts of the world. And as creators continue to create in different form and formats, we have to ask ourselves, how do we build sustainable businesses on the continent? How do we build a sustainable economy on the continent? But also, how do we make sure that there are more creators, there are more platforms, there are more investors that are actually benefiting from the activities on the continent. And I think that's really, um, hopefully the conversation we can have today around what needs to be done to make sure that happens, what type of investments we need to do, who are the people that need to step up to the, step up to the plate to make sure that happens. Um, I think for many, many years, there's sort of been this passing the buck from a policy perspective, from an investor community perspective, even from the creators um, perspective, but I think that it's become very clear now that Africa has to start to own Africa's platforms, African investments, so that we can actually be beneficiaries of this windfall. And hopefully we'll have those conversations today around infrastructure that needs to be done, structures that need to be done, um, overlooked platforms that we need to rejuvenate and bring back into the fore, and then future platforms that need to be created. So to kick off our conversation, because we don't have that much time and we have amazing people here, I would like to introduce Mr. Femio Dubemi, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. He is an amazing storyteller, a filmmaker, a producer. He is a visionary and has been instrumental to so many of the amazing things that have been seen on screen. I had the benefit of working with him for many years and also working with him on um, the Africa Magic Viewers Choice Award as a jury member and head juror when we founded and started that. He is a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures. He's um, for the Oscar Awards, everyone knows what the Oscars are. Like I said, he is a juror and um, he was head judge of mm -hmm. Africa Magic Bureau's Choice Awards. He is a juror of the Emmy Awards. He is sits on many, many platforms um, as juror and as a mentor and really has been one of the leading lights when it comes to documentaries on the continent and actually um, is a founder of a documentary festival. And these are real important platforms that help create, nurture, and promote talent. And so I'm really happy to have him here. And as someone that has seen the last 20 years of us in the industry and the creative industry struggling, building, um, succeeding, and sometimes and failing, because that is part of building, I'd like to just sort of turn over to him based on a conversation we were having earlier. When we look at structures and we look at people that are creating and we look at the businesses that support them, what are some of the key things that need to be done to start to transition us from being a purely creative economy to being actually a creative, I mean, sort of transition us from being purely creators to actually creating economies that are sustainable and actually push forward and have a lion's share of economic power from an informal sector into a formal sector. Um, thank you for joining us again. Thank you very much, um, Fiola, and thank you to the uh, Denning Africa Center for this conversation. Uh, I think it's interesting that both of us are here again. Uh, if you recall at the Intra-Africa uh, Trade Fair in November in, in um, South Africa, uh, the very conversation that uh, both of us were on a panel uh, having had to do with um, how, how do we translate this creativity um, into commerce, into something that actually mainstreams into the economy of African countries. One of the things that we established is that um, Africa has a market that, um, that when explored together, uh, can truly uh, empower the creative sector across Africa to be very important uh, as a contributor to, to uh, um, uh, our national economies. Uh, so the question is, why do we have this golden moment in, in um, a global appreciation of what you could call the African story, whether it's in film, in, in music, in fashion? I mean, because this seems to me to be a time when the world wants to actually um, explore the African story. Uh, I think we have to translate, as you, as you have said, um, from an informal sort of 
industry into a more formalized um, um, uh, industry. And the difference really is in the infrastructure. Uh, we have people with talent. We have people uh, who are able to actually connect with an audience. We don't have the enabling environment for all of the people who have um, creative ideas and creative products to actually be able um, to benefit from the economy. And that has to do with one, uh, the fact that the creative sector um, does is not quite investment attracting right now for basic reasons. One, um, rights are a big issue. Uh, copyright is, is easily the biggest uh, 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 problem for investment in African creative you know, economies. Uh, and, and that has to do not with making laws, but has to do with enforcement. Uh, you look across Africa, almost every African country has a, some form of powerful copyright um, intellectual property law. Uh, but piracy seems to be something that's almost Africa in its, in, its, in its size, in its width, and the brazen nature of it. There is always seeming to be some kind of um, second level economy where people who do not own rights actually um, are in the market. <laughs> with the products of people who own rights. And I think that has to be the first thing that you know, governments understand as a, as a very vital um, way to safeguard the creative economies. Um, you look at the music industry, you look at what it's doing globally, you look at Nollywood itself. And when you look at um, the kind of, of uh, the kind of, 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 of uh, uh, I don't want to call it noise, the, the sort of size that we presume it ought to have, um, the numbers don't actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, validate the, the impression that we have. Uh, you look at Nollywood, you look at some of the biggest films out of Nollywood, and you ask um, the figures, the data, it doesn't match, and the reason it doesn't match is that there is a, a obviously a, a, a leaking pipe in in the in the in the conveyor belt of you know what happens between creativity and the audience, and I think that's really the first thing. The second thing is obviously that we we do not have data, and data is not something that you know um, any investor likes to to guess about. We have to figure out a way that our institutional oversight over the creative industries delivers actionable data. If you ask how many films are made in Nigeria, for instance, um, they'll tell you, you know, look at the figures from the National Census uh, Board. If you look at the figures from the National Census Board, you'd be surprised that the figures that are quoted in the media of how many films are being made, how many films are being uh, put in the market, has such a large and wide um, um, uh, 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 distance from what actually is officially captured. We've got to figure out a way that, you know, investment friendly uh, uh, environment is created so that um, those who create uh, do not have to worry uh, so much about, about you know, uh, uh, these things. I think it's, it's really very uh, uh, important that Governments also think about how we leverage Africa to Africa trade. At the, at the trade fair, one of the things that was agreed that is that if Africa trades with Africa, um, it, it would be a very great uh, uh, space to um, springboard into, into the global market. Um, but if you look at beyond South Africa, for instance, I mean, South Africa has maybe 11 or 12 uh, co-production agreements with many countries. I, I doubt they have up to four with African countries, but Nigeria itself, how many co-production treaties do we have? We actually are in different markets. We're hugely in Uganda, we're hugely in East Africa, we're all over West Africa, but a lot of those uh, uh, materials are smuggled into these countries. We need to figure out a way to actually create a, a way to, um, to harness 
what uh, what can be considered uh, the biggest opportunity that Africa has. And that opportunity is that African audiences want to consume African products. They want to consume African stories. They want to listen to African music. They want to watch African films. And that in itself, um, I think is a great deal uh, uh, of an advantage in terms of where we start from. So when I talk about going from informality to formality, it's that governments across Africa must figure out a way not just to pay lip service to the creative sector as an employer. Um, is it just me? I think we've lost Femi for a minute. Um, yeah. Okay, so just quick, just um, just for the audience, um, because we are in different parts of the continent, from time to time, people might turn off their camera, um, just to make sure that if we end up having issues with internet. Also, I see some questions coming through in the chat. It will be also great for people in the chat if you want to share your LinkedIn so that we can connect and try to make this as interactive as possible. That will be great. I'm gonna see if. Um, if um, he comes, if he comes back anytime soon, but um, what we can do is, I have a, I have earmark where he sort of left off, and I'll pick up there. So um, Barry, if I okay, um, I will right, right, I will hand over to Rajesh right now. Yeah, no, I just wanted to the informality formality conversation is a big thing in the in the policy circles. You know, we're all talking about the same thing. You know, eighty percent of the of Africa's workforce is in the informal sector. And it's untapped in so many ways. So this is actually a very part of a much larger problem. Now, as I was saying uh, and, and before, when we were in the green room uh, about uh, you know the, how music and uh, and uh, and creative art, creative industries are actually start off as counterculture, so they're naturally in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. But then we they have once they become successful, then they then they are then they have to then the state and the government and we need the active engagement of, of the formal sector of the state to recognize the importance of these things. So it's a combination uh, thereof. And you know, I'm, what I'm interested in hearing from, from you and from the other people is, you know, to what extent is it probably better to stay off the radar of the government? Because we know our, our governments are not known always for, the, for acting in the best interests of, uh, of society. Uh, you know, you see what I mean, and this is a this is a question, a delicate question. Um, so that's my that's what I want to put out to the audience uh, and, and to the panelists. The, the the second thing is, of course, the African continent and free trade area will make something of a difference in kind of hopefully allowing for the movement of goods and services, especially services in this case across the continent. I don't know what your thoughts. Again, the experts on the panel might want to chip in on that. Mm. No, um, thank you for thank you for that and for throwing that out. Um, I'm sure Femi will join us in a minute. I think one of the conversations we were having, and it is you are right, there is a point in sort of the beginning and the life cycle of the creative economy where it is great to sort of be off the grid so that that economy can actually find its feet and grow. And but at the same time, I think because of the the value of the creative economies, there also has to be sort of a, an engagement with some with form, for some formality. And the reason why is because once you sort of get to a place where people need to start to get financial support, that is to grow, to scale, to expand that business, that business does need data. It does need some sort of independent, independent data that confirms that this is a real industry that does exist. And that does include some education to the people, to the practitioners in that sector, but also to the policymakers. And one of the things that used to frustrate people when I worked at a um, big um, media organization was people wanted the data of that their, they felt like it was their data because their content, it was their content, but that content was licensed and that content belongs to the platform. And that platform can freely share it with you or not share it with you. And to me, this is one of the biggest dangers that we currently see now with global platforms coming onto the continent. Once again, Africa doesn't own the data of actual viewership. And therefore that data, once again, can only be used by private by the private sector. And the private sector can decide what it wants to do with that data if it doesn't want to release that data. And so 
The challenge is it's very difficult to get access to financing, to get access to infrastructure, to build infrastructure, because if government doesn't really have um, access to data, there's no reason to create grant opportunities. There's no reason to create funding opportunities. There's no reason to say, look, we want to go out and do um, treaties with other country co-production treaties, because at the end of the day, they don't really have a sense of how much and why this is a valuable, um, this is valuable. So sometimes you're appealing to people because you're, you're using culture when really we should be using economy. We should be using the business case. And that's really, that to me is why we need sort of this, this long arm, but this engagement with policy and government to be able to extract the actual business and economical benefit of this industry. Um, welcome back, FO. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. So now you know I'm I'm calling in from Lagos, right? Ah. Um, <laughs> I said we're in different parts of the continent, and so this happens from time to time. Um, what I'll do is, if this is okay, I'll park the formal and informal conversation. I'll hand back over to Barry so that we can sort of get into the music um, and the challenges there as well. Sure, thanks, thanks, Biola. And by the way, you could be uh, for forgiven for being in South Africa with the power going off right now as well. So <laughs> we're in we're in, we're in your boat, Femi. Um, the the, uh, the the next uh, the next uh, friend colleague that I want to introduce is uh, somebody that I've worked with um, over the years as a, as a publisher and um, as, a, as, a, as a library music owner. And uh, Craig McGay has been, um, he's, he's been in the South African music business since 1992. Uh, he's, a, he's a music publisher and, and his, his Mama Dance Music Library has become the go-to place for production music across um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it gets used in TV and film adverts around the world. He's got international distribution via Sonaton and Universal. And uh, Craig's also interestingly uh, a, a part of the policy making um, side of things. And um, he's, uh, he's a board member at Capasso, which is a mechanical rights society in South Africa. And he's, and he's a long time board member at, um, at, at the Music Publishers Association. And Craig, I think you've also got uh, uh, you, you in and out of the board at Samro as well, if I, if I remember correctly. The, the main uh, publishing uh, body, performance and, rights organization. No, I, yeah. I, 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 um, I haven't ventured into Samro yet uh, on the board. No. That's that's a tough that's a tough position. I um, I'm scared of that position, but <laughs> I, I I feel for you. Yeah, absolutely. So so Craig, if we just get straight into it because. Uh, the conversation is so interesting that I can see the time is just evaporating. Um, mm. uh, half an hour went by in two minutes, which is a, which is always a good sign of, of a stimulating conversation. So a little bit earlier, Femi mentioned this idea of IP ownership as, as being a big issue. You know, the, 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 the royalty capture, the metadata capture mm. and, uh, and all of this stuff, which which I know is, you know, that's your this, this is the, the, the space in which you operate. And so, my, you know, my, what I'd like to throw out to you is this: the, the new type of content producer, perhaps in the in the in the the way that the future of the music business or the creative economies um, across all um, arms of uh, of and disciplines, is this idea of the independent practitioner, you know, um, uh, um, creating content at home and then talking directly to their market. But in order for this to happen that independent practitioner has to have some business acumen and has to understand IP exploitation. Otherwise, uh, there's, there's, there's literally no point. And I've been following a Merck Mercuriatus uh, closely over the last few years, and, and I find him a, a very interesting visionary, perhaps a, a sort of a Steve Jobs uh, type uh, visionary for the future of the music business, perhaps. And he's he said repeatedly in interviews that um, the, the best days of the music business are ahead of it if you're, if you're a content producer. And I find this a really interesting concept. And also mm -hmm. the fact that he's, 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 he's created songs as an asset class on the London Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's very interesting uh, um, moves in terms of where he's uh, uh, hedging his bets in terms of uh, 
songs and owners of songs and the fact that he wants to invert the the economic equation which right now has the content producer at the bottom he wants to put the content producer at at the top in terms of um uh, 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 earning revenue from from ip so what is craig what what are your thoughts on this idea of producing local sell global especially with regards to ip revenues and uh in and and this the the new uh um rapid growth of the independent producer of content yeah no i think it's uh the opportunities are enormous now and um you know on the streaming services it's not difficult for anybody a uh, new artist to 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 get their music onto us uh, uh through an aggregator onto spotify and apple music and a hundred other uh digital distribution streaming platforms um and on youtube which is included um so it's uh, the, the 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 cost of producing music has just dropped so much over the last 20 years that um most of our co composers uh, we work with about 100 over 100 composers in in south africa and africa and they all well most of them are have got home studios that they have self financed um so that the the ability to produce your own content record it yourself therefore you then own the the master recordings you created the 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 the, the, the song the lyrics the melodies therefore you are the uh, composer you own the the the, the song rights as well um so you're in a powerful position and um now with those channels opening up to the whole world it's uh it's it's exciting it's not easy but it, it is exciting um i i've moved on from from the record label days i mean i've yeah i think it was 1992 i went over to to london and i'd been working at a local radio station called bush radio and i, I was the music coordinator there and i had a strong passion for south african music and the quiet quieto music was just exploding and uh it, the vibe was just so powerful with with uh with 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 all the, those that 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 new uh, sound coming out and I, and I thought I could break it to the rest of the world like Chris Blackwell broke reggae music to the rest of the world and and I was kind of got on an aeroplane and went off and stayed with my friend and ended up staying in a squat in Elephant Castle and the little tiki box red tiki box outside was my office every morning to try and meet with people and and uh it was a great learning curve i didn't break quite to the world the production level of it was just too too low in a sense the sounds and and uh uh people when when it just didn't really take and now 20 years on i'm a piano which is just the derivative of quite uh the production levels have got so 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 world class because of this access to technology that it is now making in uh, making waves around the world and they say the same about Afro beats. So things have changed over twenty years uh, quite quite substantially. Um, the uh, we are working on the on this on 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 the side of the more anonymous less artist. Glory, glory side with with production music where the composers name uh, the artist names are not necessary and but this is where I've really seen the potential of producing local and distributing international um, because uh, the, it's a simple it's a far simpler process that the, the, the demand for background music for music and adverts and TV and film is is just voracious you know with the uh, with the amount of channels on satellite channels uh, dishes and uh, uh, the, the online demand is just explosive uh, TikTok is just consuming needing music all the time as has YouTube for a while so um, if one can can understand that demand. You've got the resources to produce it locally with the, with the, with the, with the, with, the, with the reasonable production uh, speakers. So it's the cost of speakers and sound cards and computers and a, and a microphone. Um, what's the issue is is that is that youngsters don't understand the 
the the the network, the the ecosystem that 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 exists, which is, I think we're looking at four, four or five different royalties. You've obviously got the performance royalties, which is a big one whenever a music is 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 is, is played over a radio or a TV. Um, and on streaming, it also is it, 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 it's it, it's a part of that. You've got the mechanical royalties when something is reproduced onto something else. It started off with reproduce, reproductions onto vinyl and then cassette and then CD and then into film and picture. And now streaming also has a component. Now you've got uh, royalties on the master recording <clears throat> so that the producers and artists are getting... Now there's, there's, there's billions of dollars flowing around the world in these collection societies and they all network to each other. And there's a huge amount of money there. But if you're a, if you're a young kid in a South African township, you're not aware of that. And uh, you, 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 can't, you, you wouldn't know to tap into it. And um, that's, that, so it's very difficult for us to convince youngsters to, to kind of uh, enter this, 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 this particular industry. It's not, like, it's not so gl- glorious in terms of you know, becoming famous, but it's a long-term money spinner. And it's quite hard for us, and we must. Um, we work on profit share type arrangements, so that if something does well, we all do well. So we are, we will give advances and things. But um, yeah, that's. So I feel like that lack of knowledge of of how those societies work and those rights um, work is 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 is, is one, uh, one 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 <clears> one tricky area, and. Um, you know, as a music publishers association, we we <clears throat> do run a series of workshops to educate um, youngsters about these things. Um, the government also doesn't understand them. I don't feel you know we, we're dealing with a copyright amendment bill at the moment, and <clears throat> quite clearly, you, the the legislators just don't understand the nuances of music publishing. So yeah, we're not getting that much support. From from that side, and we all running small businesses, and God, you know, I'm, yes, uh, it's, 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 it's quite. So I'm not sure where the responsibility lies in terms of imparting that knowledge. Obviously, once we find a young talent, we 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 we, we impart the knowledge, and we 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 talk about the contracts, and we explain things, and we'll send links to uh, music library FAQs of of how it all works, and they they can read up and. And now we have a body of composers who understand it. They're earning international royalties, dollars turning into rands. Um, and uh, yeah, slowly but surely it's working. Not sure if that's answering your question, Barry. No, absolutely, Craig. And, and I, am, I am taking some, uh, some positivity out of what you're saying. And it, it, it sounds, uh, the, the, the thread of what you're sharing is that uh, the industry is definitely going forward, but, but slowly. Uh, and and hopefully, sorry, I, hopefully, I can raise one more thing. Sorry, I'm butting in here, but on that on that issue of uh, of copyright infringements, there's been such fantastic yes. news on that front because uh, now the the internet is permanently monitored and and there's red flags and takedowns if our music is used in a in a in a TV show without permissions. There's a takedown, um, and they same with uh, TV monitoring the systems. So this kind of uh, theft of music in that arena is is so much less than it was 20 years ago when people were handing out DVDs and things like that. So another uh, really positive opportunity to, you know, closing those cracks in the system. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 brilliant. And I, and I'm, and, and selfishly, I'm glad to hear that as a, as an owner of quite a lot of work on your, on your library. So that, that's good news for me as well. Um, yeah. And, and I'm thinking that uh, a lot of the, the gaps that need to be closed are, are around education or in education. Um, yeah. And uh, perhaps that's somewhere that Hendy Business School could play a role. I see we've got the, the Dean, John Postapetti, that's just joined us, the Dean of Hendy Africa. Hi there, John. Hi there, Barry. This is fascinating. Craig, fantastically interesting. And you're from Hout Bay. So yeah. uh, I love that too. Um, yeah, perhaps, yeah, perhaps really, there's some training. Really important stuff, yeah. Um, and so, I'm very yeah. pleased that we at Henley are, are, are really working on this with, with you as well. The creative industries are so important for the future growth of Africa, not just per se for themselves, but the influence they have on other people's thinking, you know, enabling people to visualize, to imagine, to think that those capabilities are part of business generally. 
So I think um, they're much more seminal, much more um, provocatively transformational than we think these creative industries. And I think it's really important to support them. Thanks, John. So once again, uh, time's our enemy here, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to move on uh, to 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 Obi Asika. Uh, Craig, thank you very much. We'll circle back to you before we before we're done. Um, but I want to give everybody a, a, a chance at um, having something to say. Obi, welcome, and uh, I'm really delighted that you that you've joined us. And uh, for everybody on the call, Obi Asika is. Um, Last but by no means least of, of our of our panelists, he's a um, he's a creative industries leader, and um, Obi's focused and, on the possibility. Um, Obi's focused on the possibility. <laughs> Just heard myself coming back. Uh, uh, focused on the possibilities that the creative and cultural industries offer for Nigeria, Africa, and for the global um, diaspora. Uh, he's acknowledged as one of the top pioneers who's led globalization of the Nigerian music and uh, entertainment industries. And Obi is also the co-founder of the Social Media Week in Lagos, one of the largest new media and technology conferences in Africa. There's, there's a whole lot more uh, behind Obi, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to you now and you can introduce yourself. Um, and what, 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 I'd, what I'd really love to, um, to ask you, Obi, is you know, in, in a previous conversation, we had uh, we had a we had a very fascinating chat about the the, the prospects around NFTs and the, the the democratization in a way of uh, monetizing content via the the via blockchain and and and, and the the emergence of of NFTs and that that for me would be a would be a great uh, uh, conversation piece to hear from you and then and then also. This this idea of intra-Africa um, trade, which we also spoke about, and the fact that as a musician that toured globally for thirty years, I never played in Nigeria. Why is that? So if if I was with a, 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 a an internationally touring South African act, why wasn't Nigeria one of our frequent stops? So that's um, those are those are two those are two areas that I'd like to. Uh, to 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 lead you into, um, and also obviously the the new Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and and where you know, with with everything we we've, we've talked about today, including NFTs, where is this real, and is it a real opportunity for um, trading internationally, but within Africa? Obi, over to you, and and welcome again. Uh, Obi, before you answer that, just quickly, I just wanted to add one little thing. Um, it's good to see you. It's always good to see you. I just wanted to add one little thing on top of that. And um, just to build on what Craig um, was talking about when it comes to the different rights with music. And I know that you've done a lot of work around this in Nigeria. So as you talk about, I think that also ties well into the NFT space. So if there's just a way you can bring those things together, I'll, I'll love to see if we can, if we can sort of connect those dots as well. Thank you. No problem, no problem. Oh, thanks a lot. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Very well, very well. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, well, it's a pleasure. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And I was just listening keenly to what everybody was saying. And um, I mean, I think, first of all, I agree pretty much with what everybody was saying. But I also want to add a few things. I think that the opportunity, I mean, I was, I was, I was privileged to lead the, um, for the first time ever in Nigeria, we had a technical working group of the National Development Plan, which was focused on the creative economy. Um, it was culture, creative industries, hospitality, and tourism. And we were, we've, so we've done the plan up till 2025 and 2030. And the projections we have for 2030 in Nigeria is $100 billion per annum for the creative economy by 2030, with or without the government, right? And for us Nigerians, we understand what that means because we have not seen a lot of the steps that we need to see from government to enable what is happening naturally within our ecosystems. In terms of data, which Femi talked about, it's absolutely critical and that's linked to the platforms. And that's one of the reasons why we wanna see African owned platforms on the continent that are connected. I think one of the things that's a real pity for me, especially when I look at the music industry, is the death of Channel O and the less importance of things like MTV Bass, because 20 years ago, we saw a lot more South African music and Kenyan music 
in Nigeria than we are seeing today. I mean, we've been involved in exploding Afrobeats and making our people focus on ourselves, which is fine, but we're not seeing as much of the rest of the continent. And we know that the continent wants to come into here, and that is also what affects touring. So we need to create a, a funnel on this continent for ourselves so we can engage ourselves, which is sorely lacking. So we don't have a formal touring circuit in Nigeria or in West Africa. And what I always say about Afrobeats is I love seeing the guys at Madison Square Garden, Afro Nation, and all these things that are happening because that's what we built for. But when it really gets to happen for real is when Wizkid and Burner Boy are doing 40, 60 date tours in Nigeria. Because we have 40 stadiums, we have 400 universities, and that is the domestic opportunity. And if you extend it from beyond Nigeria into West Africa, and then into East Africa and then Southern Africa, then you begin to understand that some of these artists should be able to do 100 dates on the continent at arenas and stadiums. So facilities and venues are the, are the next part of the ecosystem that is needed to feed that as well. Some of that will come from real estate developers, some of that will come from governments, and some of that will come from existing facilities that are being retrofitted by promoters. Um, the issue about NFTs, what I've found and what I'm seeing is that I'm very close to the Nigerian NFT. Um, the Nigerian NFT community has about 2,000 creators, and I work closely with the founder. One of the things I found from last year is that because Nigeria has the number two crypto market in the world with something like 9 million crypto wallets in Nigeria, these guys are fast forward on this stuff. They're way ahead. Um, the crypto artists in Nigeria, people like Osinachi, I mean, Osinachi is probably the first crypto NFT artist in the world to be exhibited at, at Christie's. So these guys have been drilling down and doing this stuff for a while. And obviously the key thing about NFTs is title and ownership and the ability to stretch and have income that is residual every single time somebody does a transaction on your, on your property. So I think that we're just at the beginning of the NFT thing. I think the NFTs will eventually become literally like everybody uses them for shares, for songs, for real estate, for everything, because it's a digital title that you can't lose. And once you can link that to monetization, that's the real opportunity in terms of the blockchain, right? So yes, just to answer your question, Barry, I'm very bullish on the future of NFTs. We all know that there's a problem in the crypto markets right now, but I would say that that's just a little blip and what's going to happen in the next year and a half. Just keep watching that space. And I think you're going to see some very, very interesting things for African creators, African storytellers, and African artists. People are looking at NFTs almost one-dimensionally at this point in time. I think they're all multidimensional. You have the audio side, the interactive side, Uh, the, 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 um, the Obi, do you the, want to turn your camera off? Maybe that will help. We just lost you for us. We lost your audio for a second there, Obi, as you were talking about. Uh, the prospect for the okay, you're back. Oh, back. Was, I, I, when did you lose me? Just for just, a second. Yeah. When Bull, you're bullish on NFTs is roughly okay, where you right. went off. Yes, yeah, so I think I think definitely bullish on NFTs because I think what you're seeing is just a blip at this point in time. And I think over the future, over the coming years, African creators have enormous opportunities to own their products and also recreate products and bring them out, right? Because I think what NFTs are really enabling and Web 3.0 is enabling, the key difference about Web 3.0 and vis-a-vis -vis when the internet happened is that there are young African innovators and creators who are writing code who can affect the blockchain. So, Today, we're not just sitting with creators, we're sitting with technical players who are African, who can affect the future for what our own content is. And that is very, very important because at this point in time, I think that what I used to say before was I used to look at it like it's show business, right? So when we were pushing, and Biola will remember me saying this years back, when we were pushing the music industry or the entertainment, I said it's show business, but you have to, first of all, validate the show. I think we're, we're past that now. The show is validated. Everybody knows the show is working. Everybody knows that the show is world-class. It's global. It can sell tickets. It can sell merchandise. But now we have to get to the business. And the business is what I think some of our countries and our governments are not really understanding the significant opportunities that are, lie within these sectors. You know, we do have a lot of policy talk, a lot of, a lot of talking heads. We have a lot of um, what I would say there are funds out there as you know, but in, in our context in Nigeria, 
the ability to access these funds is very difficult for operators and the, SF, the, the sort of the small and medium scale operator. And even the bigger production companies are still not that big because we just haven't built the companies at the scale and the size that have the leverage to compete with the global giants. But what we have built is the ability to make content that is competitive. Now, for me, the biggest opportunity still for us is on the continent. So yes, AFTCA is great to see here, but I'm really interested in seeing how, you know, YouTube is the number one destination of all African content in 2022, right? And all of that data belongs to Google. I believe Femi and Biola were talking about earlier. How do we shift that situation? How do we get metadata under our control? And how do we enable our own creators to monetize everywhere? I think these are the key things for me at this point in time. Can you still hear me? Can, see, can you hear you fine? Yes, thank you. Yeah, we got you. Th thank you. Uh, Obi, has Obi, did you, did you freeze again or, or, or have you paused? I think Hello. Obi, have you paused or did you freeze? <laughs> All uh, right. We're going to take it as a, as a freeze pause. Um, <laughs> and then, um, and so I think that this would be a good time to bring um, Ethel back into the conversation. Um, and just sort of when you, I mean, when you hear, I mean, I feel like the challenges are the same. It is sort of the, how do we continue to harvest and explore the opportunities that actually exist on the continent? We, everybody is coming into the continent because they see the promise. They're bullish on Africa. Every global company will tell you they're bullish on Africa, but African companies, African businesses in this sector continually looking outside. How do we change that dynamic so that Africans actually see the opportunity on the, con on the continent? Ethel, I'll bring you back in. Um, and if we have enough time, um, I know Barry's monitoring the time, so um, he might- if I, could just, if I could just chip in there for a second, sorry, Femi. Sure. So let, let, let's, hand, let's hand over to Femi and then open it up to the floor because we've got a whole bunch of questions lining up in the chat there, Biola. So we could, prob we could probably take a few of them um, and um, so my, my suggestion is let's hear from Femi and then and then hear from some of the attendees that have got, have got some burning questions. Yeah, they're, they're, and we can group them up together and answer them. I think they said they kind of fit into similar uh, similar issues, a number yes. of them. But yes, we can we can ag aggregate them. I think what's clear to me is um, we are going to have to have some kind of intentional. Um, uh, uh, investment decisions from governments um, to showcase that investment in this industry can create the kind of wealth, the kind of uh, 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 opportunities um, to entice the private investor. I think until we fix things like data, until we fix things like having the right kind of people in the, in the regulatory, um, uh, institutions, um, it's really going to continue to be difficult for an investor to make, a, you know, a decision on putting money uh, on platforms, for instance. Uh, for me, that's really the key that maybe putting people who understand what the opportunities are in spaces, um, even within uh, uh, institutions of oversight in the creative industries, may be the beginning uh, to doing that. Um, uh, uh, Obi and I were in a, in, a, in a meeting just recently in Abuja and, and talking to people in government, uh, just talking about what kind of opportunities uh, what's happening in our, in our industries represent. And just looking at their faces, you realize that they do not understand the reality of this. They're not connected to its possibilities. And so, but they sit on it to regulate it. So they're basically working to um, rein it in rather than let it, you know, actually bloom. And I think uh, until we do that, we can't really begin to um, tick off the boxes in terms of, of what possibilities lie ahead um, of, of what's happening now you know, within these creative industries across Africa.
Thank you. Um, I guess it's time for us to go to the questions. Yeah, that 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 would be good, um, Biola. I'm just scanning through the questions. What would be, what would be great is if um, if anybody wants to, uh, uh, I think that the attendees can can uh, put their hand up. David will unmute you, and you could you could actually ask your question in a very conversational way online, uh, on the call, or I could uh, read them out. But let's see if anybody wants to. Uh, Wants to join in the conversation in real time. Can, can I also ask those of who want to join in real time to keep it, uh, keep your question fairly short and precise. Uh, so two minutes or three minutes. Uh, we we are not looking for a half an hour intervention. Yeah. Well. Well, I'll take a little gap here. I scanned through the questions and uh, I picked up one uh, of uh, let's say there is a young uh, musician in a in a country that does not have an established uh, collection management organizational structure, or they don't feel confident in it, they ask, I, I vaguely picked up the, what would their possibilities be in another country. And the, 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 the positive thing is there, you can actually join uh, world-class collection societies like PRS from London, I mean, in, in, in the UK or BMI in the States uh, directly as a, as a, as, a, as a young African composer, and they would collect international royalties uh, pretty efficiently. Or if you do that, did have a society, you could join your society, then they would, 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 would should have a relationship with all the other societies. I uh, just picked that one up, so I'm just throwing it back uh, into the to them. Great, thanks, Craig. I see uh, Fumani has got his hand up. Yeah, uh, good afternoon uh, uh, to everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Fumani, Fumani and Shilvana. I'm a TV producer and uh, an actor as well. Um, thanks for 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 having this. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite, I think it's quite important that, like as as Femi just says, mentioned something very important right now that we have a situation where we have people who don't understand this who are regulating this. We have a case here in South Africa, for example, where the president has been sitting on the copyright bill for the last three years that nothing has moved. Uh, to, to show how serious they take this particular industry. So now, my my comment, rather, I don't know if I should put it as a question, but rather my comment would be, I think one of the biggest problem is from the corporate side of things. I'll bring it here in South Africa. We have all the broadcasters who have contracts that I have signed that put you in a position as an actor that you've got shows on TV that 10 years later, that 20 years later I've been doing this, there are no any realities of sort that come out of it. So we have a, an industry that all the broadcasters, they find themselves, here's the interesting thing, they buy movies from overseas and pay those realities. But in the same country where they're supposed to value us as the worker, they don't. So I think if we don't so fix a thing like that, we will always have this type of uh, conversation where we say, what do we solve? What do we, what, what, what do we don't solve? Because already as an actor, if, if I don't get valued, it means how do I say to my child, go into that industry? Because I know that nothing will happen. Uh, so for me, I think that the, the biggest thing is if we don't also talk about how do we find or rather create policies, change policies from broadcasters to value the talent, to pay back and rather pay the, the royalties. So at the end of the day, we can recreate the work and make it meaningful. I'll give you one funny example. Three years ago, four years ago, someone created a, a Wikipedia for me. Automatically, some algorithm happened with that particular Wikipedia. I've got credits on IMBD and everything. When it put together, it said my net worth was $80 million. I laughed and got depressed at the same time because what, what value was our own system? It's very fractured. It doesn't see us serious. Like Femi said, we've got people who are sitting, making our rules, yet they do not understand. My last point, I was 21 when I first had this issue. The minister then of arts and culture, it was Paulo Jordan, he came to the state theater to give an imbiz of sort about arts and whatever. And he mentioned something that at, 
a 21 year old entry into the level, into, 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 into space, I knew that this man didn't understand what he was talking about. 20 years later, we are still sitting in the same place where Femi is saying the same thing. So I think my last point, let's talk and find a ways of changing the corporate, the broadcasters to value the workers. Hopefully it can uh, uh, trickle down to change the whole thing. Thank you. Thanks, Bobani. Um, uh, I've got, we've got two other participants raising hands, but um, folks, if we could just, uh, as Rajneesh asked uh, a few minutes ago, if we could just keep the, the questions quite brief, because otherwise we're going to run out of time, and I'd love to, um, I'd love to get a, a, a round of feedback from, from all the panelists. We've got such a valuable group here. Let's try and get as much out of them as we can in a short amount of time. So just some, some, some uh, succinct questions, please. Um, Tosin. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to join. And Great. I really appreciate you for putting up this forum where we can discuss. Um, my take is really about African fashion. African fashion in terms of clothing lines, African designs for clothes. I can see that generally at this time we have we have different international fashion, fashion design like Nike, uh, Tommy, Ralph Lauren and the lights who are really uh, doing great over there. So now looking at African design, African clothes, uh, especially when we consider the fact that African you see African in almost every continent, in almost every country. Uh, can we, uh, I'm really uh, interested in seeing African designs, African clothes design, African clothes designers, um, being able to participate in the global fashion space where they have their shops, where they have their designs all over the countries in different continents and then being promoted. So if it's going to be, venture capital promoting all these uh, uh, African fashion designers, helping them to market it and also uh, create, helping them to create markets globally. That would be something that I would be more interested in having a conversation about and um, something my team and myself will really want to, to, to support. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tosin. Very good points, and I'm glad you raised the, the the fashion industry. And if I can, I'm I'm going to hand this to Obi because if 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 I can quote uh, if I can quote you, Obi, fashion is actually the largest segment of our of our creative industries, but it's not recognised as such. And um, so, so in, in terms of revenue, I think music's the smallest, and and uh, and fashion is bigger, but. Uh, 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 Music has the biggest footprint, but but uh, the biggest revenue is fashion. Do you want to do you want to talk to that for a for a for a while? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I was just saying to uh, just repeating what Tosin was saying that I mean, when we did our when we did our research, the Nigerian fashion industry was if you if you look at the the, the French people, AFD did did some did some reports. I think they were sitting at about four to eight billion dollars per annum, with fashion being by far the biggest segment. And then there are a lot of big players in fashion who are relevant and building brands that are working, but a lot of them are using digital. So like physical retail is not as as big as digital Instagram and all these new tools. But yeah, I think fashion is enormous, and I think it requires a lot more work. The sort of thing I really want to see is where we connect our markets, like our back, which is a humongous street market in the east of Nigeria that produces enormous amounts of apparel, clothes, shoes, and stuff, and connect it with the designers who are sitting in the city centers in Lagos, in Enugu, in Kano, in Kaduna, so we can get mass production and mass retail going. Um, I think there's big, big opportunities in all of that, and um, that's something that I look forward to seeing happen. Great, thanks, Obi. Uh, Obi, we... oh, sorry, just to quickly interrupt. I see a number of questions and people kind of wandering around the question of building cap uh, human capabilities, people capacity across the continent, and I think that's certainly, you know, something that uh, that is, uh, you know, it's getting the right people yeah. in place. You know, we had this. Femi and I were talking earlier about this. You know, the infrastructure is not only about hardware. But the people to to make that make the to make to use that hardware successfully 
talented people and keeping them uh, and keeping them there, developing their because you're going to lose a lot of people to to you know the, to the diaspora as often is the case. The best people seem to end up in the states or in Europe. How do we produce enough people that you know we end up having a flow of people rather than losing everyone? Uh, brain drain that takes place at a massive scale. As everyone in this forum will know, you know, whether, whether you're in South Africa or in Nigeria, uh, you know, anyone who's any good seems to gravitate gradually out of the out of the out of the continent. Uh, perhaps uh, some one of the amongst our panelists might want to address this. Um, sh sure. Um, I actually wanted to address um, a little bit about the broadcasting model. So um, just quickly regarding broadcasters on the continent, um, very few broadcast there's there's very few broadcasters that are actually um, profitable and sustainable on the continent today. Most broadcasters um, across the continent have some sort of um, hybrid model that they work out with. And when I'm saying this, I'm not talking about, I mean, I'm not talking about cable. Um, I'm talking about just your basic broadcasters, which is where most of people get their entertainment from. It's not subscription models. Most people get their entertainment from free to air or from um, um, digital DTT or, or um, and those, those broadcasters, very few of them. And part of the reason why is because the advertising model on the continent is extremely fragmented. There are very few advertisers that actually pay the same thing that other markets pay. And also, if we look at globally what's happening around royalty, there's also an um, royalty payments on audiovisual is also being more limited if you look at platforms. So most of the platforms today, streaming platforms, actually don't pay royalties in the same ways that studios used to pay in the past. And so I think that as creators, as we look at the future, I think the key is how, what are new ways of monetization? And I think that's where ownership comes in, who owns what, and really doing more collaborative projects rather than just seeing yourself as talent, that you're more than talent. And so that talent actually, today, talent is much more involved in the creative process. And so I think that there has to be a different way of thinking of creating lifelong revenue and sustainability for yourself as a talent. Um, and if you see, you'll see that most people that actually, most talent that's working with, on, with streaming platforms today are actually producers on those projects as well. From, uh, and that's just so that they can improve the, the, um, the earning potentials. And I, I, and I can tell you this because most public, most broadcasters on the continent are going out of business. There's just, the business model doesn't work. And so we need to be cognizant of that as we think about broadcasters. And then the other thing around how do we retain and build talent on the continent? There are a lot of opportunities that are coming up on, on the continent, but monetization continues to be a challenge, which for me, those are the things that excite me about us building sustainable plat platforms on the continent is where people can actually make money. I love the fact that people are on YouTube, people start a channel and they start making money. But at the end of the day, those people also need to be compensated, there needs to be infrastructure, there needs to be organizations that are actually building our talent. To be fair, once again, there are not a lot of institutions that actually specialize in building the right talent. Um, one of the things Craig said earlier was about the quality of our content sometimes. They're very, I mean, we can count how many professional sound engineers exist on this continent and how many are we churning out every year. Sound is the most critical thing in every creative industry we've talked about today when it comes to music, when it comes to TV, when it comes to film, if you don't have your sound right, you cannot sell globally. And we are not churning out the type of high quality people that we need to, to actually be able to even fulfill the need that we have here on the continent, talk less of going out. So I think it's really important as people come into this industry Number one, we do need to create more educational opportunities, but we also need to help people understand where those opportunities exist. Everyone believes that the only opportunity is picking up a camera, but there's so many more back of house opportunities that we need young people that will sustain them and they will create real livable lives and livable wages. And I think for me, that's really important that we create those opportunities when it comes to skill development. Yeah, spot on, Viola. And, and building on what you're saying, in, in, in the music industry, definitely, um, there's there's overflowing talent, as, as we all know. There's no shortage of performance talent, composition talent. But but I feel a lot of the time uh, the ball gets dropped in the last in the last 10 yards. 
in terms of the final packaging process. And it's exactly what you're saying. Unless the talent is packaged in a way that the, the, the global audiences can understand and assimilate, uh, the, 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 the industry falls short. So, so training and that kind of capacity building is, is, is critical. And uh, I see a question here for, from Abby Sola um, asking about uh, how African media, <laughs> media powerhouses can take risks with young creatives and train them, um, which uh, is happening, not enough. I mean, the multi-choice talent factory, for instance, is a, is, a, is a good example of exactly that, taking risks with young creatives and, um, and, uh, and, and training, but th there's not enough. And, and too much of the time, um, successful creatives are, su are succeeding in spite of the circumstances, not because of it. And I think that's the, the, the core of our conversation today. Um, uh, Femi, Biola, Craig, Obi, um, I'm, I'm, the floor is yours. Have, have a look at the questions and um, we, we, we can see where the, 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 the gaps are and where the question areas are. So let's, uh, let, let, let's, get, let's get thoughts from you guys. Uh, about what about what you think can be done you know what what are some tan tangible next steps that could be that could be taken let me just add to what Biola uh, just said because i think it's very important one of the drawbacks i mean i i is, think oh uh, uh, go ahead <laughs> one of the drawbacks of of the industry in, in africa today is that the creative industry seems to be uh, composed of only creatives and I think that's really a, a big problem because essentially until we understand how to integrate, you know, other very important sectors, the, 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 the entertainment law is a big thing. It's one of the, 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 the um, critical uh, elements that, that we're missing. Um, uh, our artists don't have promoters, they don't have public relations companies, they don't have managers that, actually have uh, what you would consider to be expertise um, in managing not just the content of, 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 of our creativity, but how to actually expand its market. Um, when we talk about the diaspora, there's a, there's a lot that's going on in terms of the available uh, talent in the diaspora, but they, they can't come and work here in a situation where, you know, the, the basis for their engagement is, is not uh, certain. Um, the government is not quite clear about things like, you know, the, the piracy, copyright, all of these things debar investment. They actually make it impossible for people to then, you know, infuse the kind of uh, uh, money that, that is needed. Hence, the platforms that come into Africa um, come into more pop. They just come in and take stuff out because one of the things that I, I think is also a problem is that when they come here, uh, there's this thing, this geo-blocking thing that ensures that, you know, the content of Africa that they put on their platform are limited to Africa, often quite limited to Africa. So if effectively, they're mining the very audiences that we ought to aggregate and, and, and protect and, and explore. Um, so we've got to figure out a way. We've got to figure out a way where, I mean, training is important, uh, uh, but not just training in how to make creative products, but training in how to um, build the, the structures, the financial structures, the legal structures, the rights structures that allows, um, you know, the, the, the allows uh, sustainability. Uh, Obi, you you were you were going to say something a little bit earlier. Thanks, Femi. You're on Are mute. You? Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to come back to the idea of of um, you know the in the spirit of the AFTCA, I really do believe that there are significant opportunities for Africa to build its own platforms, its own digital platforms, which would enable OTT music streaming, right, and e-commerce. Because yes, you have got Amazon, you've got eBay, you've got Jumia, but I believe there's space and I believe that we have enough innovators on the continent who can disrupt. And we need to, what we need to see happening, it's a bit like what Femi was saying earlier, um, players in the creative space need to be working with players in the innovation space, right? We need to be seeing technology 
as the most critical tool to help us scale what we're doing because we can't do it with brick and mortar so we have to do it with the digital skills on the internet um, and i think some of the things we have to do is let's learn from what others have done how did china do it how did india do it what is brazil doing right because some of these nations have done it outside the ecosystem of america and the west and we need to be able to look at this because this is what this is all about ownership and ip at the end of the day that metadata that we're talking right now you're a creator on day one you're a creator on your creator for oh no as as it was getting really interesting the I know. Audio um, <laughs> it's always the case um Obi -Wan, Obi -Wan. Lagos, Lagos internet laid me down as, Obi, as you back? yeah i'm here back. but i don't know if you're hearing me I'm here. You, I never we went. We can anywhere. hear you now. We lost you a minute ago. Yeah, no, yeah. So, I mean, what did you, what's the last thing you heard me say? Um, you, just platforms, people that have done it outside of the American system. Yeah, China, because, Brazil. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the American system, by the way. But it, it's just that, you know, it's interesting to me how China and India locked them out and built their own platforms to build their own ecosystems, right? That's exactly what they did. It's a bit late now to be locking out YouTube, you understand? But everything is on YouTube. Nobody can compete with YouTube in terms of what YouTube do, right? So we have to think, that's where the disruption comes. It's like somebody listening, some of the young guys, the guys who are writing code, the guys who've got platforms that haven't scaled yet, maybe need to sit with creators and people like Femi, filmmakers, directors, who have the creative vision of what they want to see, but we all need solutions to enable us to scale and monetize. I think perhaps the biggest thing we didn't talk about is merchandise. I mean, Nigerian Soft Power has over a billion followers and literally has no merchandise. That's billions of dollars just being, that, doesn't, that we're not able to participate in because we don't have trust and transparency between the local production Yep. Uh, yeah, we've lost him again. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that these are all the things that we are not able to build on and um, capitalize on because we don't have the infrastructure in place. Um, we all know, I mean, you know, how do you start to, how do you create the next Marvel out of Africa? That is important. But those, uh, th but that takes a different way from us operating than we are today and different sense of ownership of what we're creating um, and platforms that can manage that ownership. So I think that um, for me, this has been great. This has been a great conversation. Um, Barry, how are we doing on time? And then um, what, there's still some questions um, yeah. coming through. Biola, yes, I well, I agree with you 110%. It's been an amazing conversation and hopefully one we can do more of. Um, what, Something that Femi said right up front just stuck in my mind, and I think it's a it's a wonderful uh, uh, way to to um, perhaps start winding down the conversation because we've got ten minutes left to wrap up. Um, but right at the start, uh, Femi shared in, in his his opinion was that, that that we we have a golden moment right now where the world wants to explore the African story. On, and the African story being all aspects of the of the creative economies, and I and I, and I think that's a that's a that's a wonderful uh, visual to for, to 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 keep in mind, and that that leads the question actually leads all our questions about how how does Africa make that story available to the world, you know what 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 needs to happen from uh, private and um, and 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 public sectors. And that, that so it really encapsulates everything we've been talking about today. So, so we we could either uh, do a do a, um, a Rajneesh, I see, I saw your I saw your finger go up there. Yeah, no, I got really excited when Viola mentioned uh, Marvel because I started thinking about the source of of this stuff, and that is the written word. And you know, mm -hmm. then we're talking about Marvel and comics, and then 
I remember that as a kid, I used to, my, the, we didn't read American comics in, 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 in secondary school in Nigeria. We read I have, Ikebe Super, if anyone remembers this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and there was a Landspear. Uh, I don't know which country Landspear yeah, came from. Yeah, Landspear. Uh -huh. So th this is the this is this is stuff that starts <laughs> off and then becomes you know this marvel you can see the marvel story but except that it they at least disappeared we don't had didn't have any of that stuff it was the written word you know on Nisha market literature people would write books people wrote books there were bookshops where you could buy books um, that's gone so it's actually there's a there's there's a it's, it's kind of a food chain you start off with the writing uh, you start off at schools. You know, um, and then it moves on from there. But why have has all this disappeared? You know, where where is the KB Super? You know, uh, uh, you know, for love or money, you can't buy a copy now. <laughs> Sorry, quick you comment. Know the, you know, the funny thing is, the the comic guys are getting really big here, yeah. but they're very niche. So you know, they've got local Comic Con. A couple of the guys have gotten deals. They've got some very very talented storytellers. And the the funny thing, the, this thing you said is like. I mean, I say this thing for years, Shango and Thor, what's the difference, right? What's the difference? You know, Nigerians will say it's packaging, right? <laughs> I, say, I, I say Nigerians abandoned Shango somewhere in the west of Nigeria. 100 million Yoruba people abandoned him. The rest of us abandoned him. Thor's approaching $100 billion. That's the problem in Africa. You know, <laughs> that's the problem. We don't, we don't actually, we haven't been able to get past our sort of colonial blockers to unlock our mythology. And our mythology, to me, is worth a trillion dollars. Easy. Yes. It's an MCU. So the MCU, the the MCU hasn't has anything Africa. to do research. I mean, <laughs> if you look at the work of Wole Shoenka, you know, he, he used all of these this imagery in his poetry, in his writing. And uh, again, Nobody, nobody reads this stuff. You know, it's, it's, there is a problem of actually when it comes to reading, it's a, it goes back to schools, really. Uh, the education, the fact that people don't have books and don't have access to the printed word, also in part because it's costly to produce this stuff and there's copyright issues. But there's a huge issue. Obi, I completely agree with you. And it's a bit frustrating when I'm outside this business. I just look at it and think, no, where is all this information? I'm walking around telling people about stuff like this, and they think, oh, well, they look at me as an old man, which is technically correct. Uh, when you start saying KB Super, they look at you strange. But anyway. <laughs> wow, so wow. That was that was great. I think that one of the things that um, these type of conversations help us realize is the richness of the African story. And now it's sort of how do you tell the what is the African brand story going to be? Um, and just sort of thinking about these things, when you look at um, some of the markets in Tha when you look at the Thai Tha um, Thailand market and you look at the Vietnamese market, actually their films are based on written words. So they take stories. Some of them are popular. Some of them are not. But it's sort of based on literature, and that's what they build off. That's how they build up their stories. So most of the stories are familiar stories that people have read. And so that sort of that changed. That was a game changer for them when they sort of started to say, "How do we change the consumption patterns?" Because everyone had this challenge where there, there was a flood in the market of global content. And to get back to indigenous content, you have to figure out where, what is, what is my unique selling proposition? What is the unique thing? What do I have that's unique that I can share? And everyone locally wants to hear and see and consume that can also have an opportunity, that, that can be a global opportunity. But like Obi said earlier, you almost have to start with the local opportunity. And if you're if, if the local market loves it, it will be consumed globally. And that's what our music did. The music was created for us here and now it's global. And that's what we have to do with our stories. Indeed. So, folks, should we uh, should we wrap up the last five minutes just getting uh, a, a, a few sound bites from everybody, from uh, all the panelists and uh, and you, Biola, and Rajneesh, as a, as a, as as a, as a, as a sort of a show of hands of the the closing, put some closing thoughts before we um, send everybody off to uh, go and have dinner. 
let me just start off by saying to the young people in the audience, go and find Lanspear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's my own comment. Okay, it will be <laughs> over to you. Yeah, I mean, just in the, in, 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 in the spirit of what he said, if you haven't heard of Shango, look him up. That's the original God of Thunder and War. Our stories are the best. Craig? I love it. Um, yeah, Thor, I, I've never been a huge uh, Marvel fan but i've got a 10 year old and a 12 year old so i sat through the through the most uh, recent thor uh, movie in 3d <clears throat> and then uh today one of our libraries that we represent sent a, a press release saying they placed music in in that movie and um we were like jumped at it we must tell everybody nice. we must tell everybody so um, yeah well, let's let's uh, build our own thors I'm, I'm completely with you guys FO, ah, you're, you're on, on mute. mute. You're on mute. Uh oh, I can't hear you. I said I've loved this Shango and Thor comparison that OB makes for almost 10 years. Truth of it is, we we gotta gotta go. it long, so. we're going to make the film. We've got to, that's true. <laughs> We've got to figure out a way to, to decolonize our. Uh, uh, culture industries, they, 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 it, it, because on, until we do that, we can actually bring all our opportunities into the same, you know, conveyor belt. Um, telling our stories from from our literature, telling our stories from, you know, um, our, our folklores and all yeah. of that is so critical. There's no point in having this active buzz with with our creative industries if we're not going to represent uh, what you will call our own heritage, our own worldview, and, and all of that. So there is um, also part of this, a conversation about what is our brand story, like, uh, like Viola says. And, and for me, the first thing about our brand story is also consider how do we decolonize our imagery, decolonize our, 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 our industry. So when we say Ikebe, Super, um, our kids know what it is, um, and that generationally, we are able to, um, to, to, to transmit uh, what it is that we represent. Thank you, thank you. And, and from, from, from my side, uh, what the, 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 the signal, the loud, clear signal for me is learn about NFTs and uh, leapfrog the <laughs> leapfrog the traditional uh, obstacles and just talk directly to the audience. That's the power of, that's the power we have in our hands. And in terms of um, legacy and, and, and knowing where we come from, there needs to be more of what, uh, Obi, your series of uh, Afrobeat, that, you know, that, that's the stuff that needs to be, that's what needs to be happening. That's the way we preserve the legacy that should be happening all over the continent. So I'm giving you a punt there for your for your series, but but really, I mean, that was an amazing. Uh, that's an amazing. I didn't get to plug it. Oh. <laughs> Here's go your for opportunity. It. Put, go ahead and plug it. Awesome work. Yeah, he's awesome watched work. Journey of the Beast on the show, man. Okay, put, put it in the in the in the chat function, and everyone can then uh, put a link in, and they can all go and have a look afterwards. Yeah, I'm just putting it. And Biola, the last word is yours. Well, I mean, once again, thank you everyone for being here. I mean, I think this light, this conversation shows the huge opportunity that is really, that it, that it is in our hand. And um, our story um, is a business story. It is a story that will contribute to our economy. And what we need to do is get to a place where we have a real partnership between policymakers, creatives, technical talent, to really, and you know, brand talent, every talent to really create the future we want because that is the beauty of the creative economies. It really can change. It is a game changer for any economy and it needs to be our story here on the continent. So thank you everyone for joining us today and really for your contribution. As always, great people, this has been a great conversation. Now let's go and make some great stories. <laughs> Thanks, Viola. And uh, thanks to the Dunning African Center. Uh, 
Rajneesh, thanks for your for your vision for for putting these series this webinar series together, and um, hope to see you all again soon. Enjoy your dinner wherever you are and whatever you're having, um, uh, and we'll and we'll see you all in September. Take care, guys. Thank you so much, Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yes. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye.